Hello, and welcome to the Nutrition Diva Podcast. I'm your host, Monica Reinagel, and today I want to talk to you about choline, an important nutrient that you might never have even heard of. Choline is sometimes lumped together with the B vitamins, and while it's not technically a B vitamin, it does share some characteristics that are common to that family of nutrients. We humans do have the ability to manufacture choline in our livers. We call that de novo synthesis or synthesis from new, but we can't make enough of it to meet our needs. And so even though we can manufacture it, it is still considered an essential nutrient, meaning we must get it or at least some of it from our diets. We need choline to make a lot of biologically important molecules, including phosphatidylcholine and the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. It's critical to brain and nervous system function, and it plays a very important role in early brain development, both in the womb and in early life. In fact, new research on the role of choline in fetal brain development has prompted the American Medical Association to push for a higher level of choline in prenatal vitamins. Up until recently, many prenatal formulations didn't even include choline or included it only in very small amounts. So the AMA would now like to see 450 milligrams of choline in prenatal formulations. Now, one challenge with this is that choline is sort of a bulky nutrient, and so including it in higher amounts in a prenatal would make the tablets a lot bigger. It might be more feasible to recommend that pregnant women take a choline supplement in addition to their prenatal, but for now, it's really up to women and their doctors to make sure that this need is being met. Now, choline has a lot of other important functions in the body as well, including protecting the liver. A deficiency of this nutrient can lead to a buildup of fat in the liver, which can eventually lead to liver damage or even liver cancer. I talked a little bit more about this in my episode on non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So where do we get it? Well, the richest dietary sources of choline are eggs, but also organ meats like liver, fish and shellfish, beef, pork, and chicken. So mostly animal-based sources. Of the plant-based sources, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, and other cruciferous vegetables are your best bets. So how much choline is enough? That turns out to be a very good question. Choline doesn't have a recommended daily allowance, an RDA, because the panel of experts that establishes those recommendations feels that there's not enough data to determine what amount is sufficient. And in that situation where there's not enough information to set an RDA, the National Academy of Medicine sort of punts by setting an adequate intake, or AI, instead. And this is based on the amount that healthy people seem to be eating, with the assumption that if they're generally healthy, well, then they must be getting enough. So the AI for choline is 550 milligrams per day for adult men and 425 milligrams for adult women, and a bit more if you're pregnant or breastfeeding. But you know what? That number is based primarily on a single study involving only men, which found that those men who were getting less than that amount were at risk of developing a fatty liver. And then the amounts for women, children, and teens were extrapolated from that number based mostly on relative body size. But you know what? Women and children are not simply smaller men. There are a lot of important hormonal and metabolic differences between these groups that might affect their needs. Here's just one example. Choline researcher Marie Caudill from Cornell University explained to me that estrogen upregulates de novo choline synthesis in the liver. So premenopausal women may need less dietary choline than men do in order to prevent deficiency. On the other hand, due to the role that choline plays in tissue expansion and fetal brain development, pregnant women may need much more. And in fact, some of Caudill's research has shown benefits for women who are taking twice the AI recommendation during their pregnancies. Given its importance, I'm really eager for researchers to produce enough evidence that would allow us to set a recommended daily allowance for choline for all those different life stages. And hopefully, we're getting closer to that threshold of evidence. But in the meantime, we're kind of stuck with this AI. 
Oh, we also have an upper limit or UL for choline. The recommended maximum intake is 3,500 milligrams a day. And that's half the amount that has been shown to cause symptoms of toxicity. Now, just to reassure you, it would be pretty tough to come anywhere close to this upper limit through your diet alone. You'd have to eat two dozen eggs or 35 servings of meat a day in order to get there. So virtually the only way to overdo it with choline is through supplementation. And choline is just not a very widely used dietary supplement. So you might be wondering, how much choline do people typically get from their diets? Recent dietary surveys suggest that most of us are only getting between 65 and 75 percent of the adequate intake. But remember that that AI may be higher than the actual needs for many groups. And there doesn't appear to be evidence of widespread choline deficiency in healthy people. But I was wondering whether vegetarians might be at increased risk. Maybe not, according to Dr. Caudill. Those who don't eat eggs or meat are most likely getting a lot less choline than those who do. On the other hand, she says, they may be getting more betaine. That's a closely related nutrient that's found primarily in plants. Our bodies can make betaine from choline, but if we're getting a lot of betaine from our diets already, that might spare some of the choline we do take in for other uses. So those with higher betaine intakes could theoretically need less choline. Again, more research is needed. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about the link, the possible link between choline and prostate cancer. A Nutrition Diva listener recently asked me to look into this after he came across some research showing that choline seemed to increase the risk of prostate cancer. It's actually a little more complicated than that. A couple of observational studies in men with prostate cancer found that those who got more choline from their diets had a higher risk of dying of their disease. On the other hand, large population studies find an inverse relationship between choline intake and cancer, meaning that those who get more choline have a lower risk. Now, Dr. Caudill doesn't find this so surprising. Choline is very important for cell division, she explains, and that's one of the reasons it's so important during pregnancy when there's a very high rate of cell division. But cancer is also characterized by a high rate of cell division, but in this case, it's pathological. So it makes sense that a nutrient that would fuel healthy cell division in healthy people could also support unhealthy cell division in someone with cancer. We've seen similar situations with folic acid. For the general population, folic acid appears to be protective against colon cancer, but for those with colon cancer, a high intake of folic acid might promote the growth of the cancer. And I talked about that in more detail in my episode on folic acid and cancer risk. So obviously, nutrition recommendations always need to be tailored to the situation. And anyone with cancer or a history of cancer should definitely consult with their oncologist or better yet, an oncological nutritionist about their diet and any supplements that they take. Now, some have also suggested that there might be a link between choline and heart disease. And the link here is similarly complex. High levels of an inflammatory molecule called homocysteine have been linked to an increased risk of heart disease. And one of choline's many functions is as a methyl donor, which recycles homocysteine into the less reactive molecule methionine. So it's logical to think that choline would help protect the heart and reduce the risk of heart disease. On the other hand, choline intake can increase blood levels of TMAO. That's a metabolite that has been identified as another possible risk factor for heart disease. But TMAO production is not only affected by diet. It's also influenced by our gut microbes. And in part, it's genetically determined. And then there's this. Fish consumption, which has long been recognized for its heart protective properties, raises blood levels of TMAO to a far greater extent than eggs, beef, or other high choline foods. So it's really unclear whether higher TMAO levels as a result of choline consumption, as opposed to other causes, 
is a factor in heart disease. For what it's worth, large population studies have found no correlation between choline intake and the risk of heart disease. So at this point, you may be wondering, do I need a choline supplement? Well, you know I'm always in favor of getting our nutrients from foods rather than supplements, especially when this motivates us to prioritize whole foods in our diets. And those who are including eggs and or meat in their diets are probably getting enough choline to meet their needs. Those who are looking for plant-based sources of choline should be sure to include broccoli, Brussels sprouts, and other cruciferous vegetables on a regular basis. But there are people in certain categories, such as pregnant and breastfeeding women, who may need more. So be sure to discuss the merits of choline supplementation with your doctor if you're in that category. There's a transcript of this episode along with links to the various research that I reviewed and talked about, and also links to those related episodes on fatty liver and the one on folic acid and cancer risk. It's all at quickanddirtytips.com. Now, before I wrap up, I also wanted to let you know about a free workshop that I'm giving this weekend with Brock Armstrong. As you may know, Brock and I are co-creators of a coaching program called Weigh Less, in which we help people achieve sustainable weight loss. And on October 3rd, we're going to teach our top five strategies for shifting out of a dieting mentality and into a weighing less mindset, which is so much more fun. You can sign up for free at weighless.life slash QDT workshop. The Nutrition Diva podcast is a quick and dirty tips podcast. It's audio engineered by Nathan Sems with script editing by Adam Cecil. Our operations and editorial manager is Michelle Margulis. Our assistant manager is Emily Miller. Our marketing and publicity assistant is Davina Tomlin. And our new intern is Jake Johnson. Welcome, Jake. That's all for this episode. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next week.